say thank you, first of all, on uh, officially. Thank you so much for uh, taking out the time of your busy uh, Hollywood star schedule to come and uh, mess with me out here in Chicago, uh, including when you were around in person, uh, when you come in and out, man. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome, Aaron. You're, you're, you're home. You know, <clears throat> I, I love talking to people back home. I've been out here 40 something years and I miss Chicago every single day. I don't miss 40 below zero. No, uh, you know, <laughs> and we will get Chicago snow boy, today. Yeah. <laughs> when you're a Chicago boy, you know, the oldest cliche is that you can take the boy out of Chicago, you can't take the Chicago out of the boy. And that's so true, you know. Yeah, that is true. That is true. And man, we, we appreciate you, especially because you guys actually did uh, bring the Laugh Factory up here, which we're hoping will survive this COVID thing. We're going to make sure it happens, you know. It's, but since everything is cu happening right now, it's been tough. And just for those people who are who will be seeing this, who actually, uh, for some reason, if they have not known who you are, you are uh, Tom Driesen, comedian that's been around uh, since the Johnny Carson days. And you, uh, I remember being a kid one time, and you and uh, you and Tim uh, were you were on the Tonight Show, I think it was, or you were on some show, and I got to see y'all work together, which was. Man, it just stuck in my head for years and years and years until now that I get a chance to talk to you, man. So anybody watching this should go ahead and take a look, figure, you know, uh, Google you, YouTube you, all of that, man. So uh, thank you again, and that's the introduction. So let's get down to business, because this thing is not free. They only give us 40 minutes without having to pay for it, and I don't, I don't want to waste any of my time with you, uh, you know. So the first thing I'd like to say, man, is... Um, uh, can you tell us like at least two of your really your your favorite achievements uh, in your career? Well, doing the Aaron Foster Zoom show, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's all downhill from here. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Man. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me start out by telling those folks who may or may not know. This is my 50th year in show business. I've been in a stand-up comedian for 50 years. For the first six years, I was with a comedy team. Tim Reed and I were America's first black and white comedy team. <clears throat> Excuse me. History shows we were the last. Um, we did, <clears throat> we had an album out. Um, you know, we toured the nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, in the days when there were no comedy clubs. So we worked all black clubs in the north and the south and all white clubs in the north and the south. We worked places in Chicago, what they affectionately call the Chitlin Circuit, black owned, black operated nightclubs. In Chicago would be the Cotton Club, the uh, High Chaparral, the Burning Spear, Guys and Gals, the Dating Club Lounge. Um, those are the clubs we worked in. We, and on the road, we, the Sugar Shack in Boston, the High Chaparral, I mean the Sugar Shack in Boston, the um, uh, 20 Grand in Detroit when, when Motown was in Detroit. Mm. We worked those clubs. And then we worked the Club Harlem in Atlantic City before they had gambling. <clears throat> and this was the Chitlin Circuit. Um, and, and then we worked the Playboy clubs and so forth and so on. So we were groundbreakers in so many ways. No one had ever seen a black guy and a white guy on stage together doing comedy. Right. And so we, at that time, the Vietnam War was raging. Students were protesting all over America. Um, the the uh, Vietnam War, I had just gotten out of the service. Tim just got out of college. And uh, it, was, it, was a, a, it was tumultuous times. There were uh, race riots all over America. In the middle of all this, we were going across the land just trying to make people laugh. Yeah. We did 11 prisons in one year. We did the county jail in Chicago many times. Wherever there was racial tension, Tim and I would go perform. We didn't lecture, we just wanted to make people laugh. And so if you, when you said one of the greatest accomplishments, uh, I, could t I, I did 61 appearances on The Tonight Show. I toured with Frank Sinatra for 14 years after the team broke up. There were a lot of things I could go to, but one of the things that touches my soul to this day, wherever Tim Reed and I went to perform, in high schools and in colleges, like I say, wherever there was racial tension. I can't tell you how many times a young white kid would come up to me and he'd say, you know, I, uh, I have a black friend that I want to reach out to. But if I do, he said, I know that I'm going to catch all kinds of hell. But after watching you and Tim today, I'm going to do that. We'd have a black guy come up to us, a black kid. He'd say, you know, I got a white friend that I, I really like and I'd like to reach out to him, but the brother's going to wear me out. In those days, you didn't see that. He said, but after watching you and Tim, I'm going to reach out to my friend. That, to this day, means more to me than anything that I could have ever accomplished in show business as, as a, a comedian. Uh, that, that's one of the things. Yeah. The other thing uh, were uh, what you could do with your celebrity. 
you know, in, in the years that I, I was doing the Tonight Shows and everything, I went back to Chicago because my sister had multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And, and I, she, she helped raise me when I was a kid, and, and I loved her dearly. She passed away, but when she was alive, I ran 26 miles every year for multiple sclerosis to raise money for MS. Every year I'd come to Chicago and run 26 miles, and I'd bring my celebrity friends, Smokey Robinson, uh, Frankie Avalon, Frankie Valley, um, Eddie Marinero, uh, Tony Danza, um, uh, the, the Chicago Cubs, uh, um, the, the uh, Bears, they would all help me. And they would run part of the way with me. Smokey okay. Robinson, Joan, who ran all 26 miles with me. And we raised a lot of effort. So those are the kind of things when you look back on your career that, that, uh, that I really feel grateful for, you know, that, uh, that, that I was lucky enough to be in show business and to be a stand-up comedian. I loved stand-up comedians before I ever was one. I never knew I'd be a stand-up comedian, but I'd watch stand-up comedians on stage and say, isn't that wonderful with their dialogue and their, their observation of life. They're making people laugh. They're, they're, they're bringing people together that ordinarily might not be together. And they're causing a sound to come out of this person's body that fills the air like electricity and unites everybody. Laughter, you know, anyhow. Oh man, yeah, um, that actually is spectacular. I think that may, maybe you had uh, put some of that on me because I think one of the things that I think I brought to the scene here in Chicago and across the nation is that I was always never afraid to cross the lines with the color barriers that stood all the way up until the years, uh, into current times in comedy. As people don't realize how segregated comedy really is when you. Um, look at people that aren't wealthy or rich or haven't made it. Because once you cross over and you start making it, everybody seems to appear on television even more now than in the past. But like I was one of five, six people between 2000 and 2008 that would do comedy on the the north side of the Sears Tower. And so uh, I always thought it was strange that people wouldn't come over. They were always set in their way. So I I thank you for opening that door right there, man. So that's that's fantastic. Um, so here we are in 2020. Everybody's locked in, uh, in their houses, dealing with this COVID situation. Um, and you have uh, 40, 45 years in the game. So you've learned how to survive through the ups and downs of everything, including extreme segregation. Uh, including the Reagan years, the Carter years, where people weren't weren't able to, you know, they were paying eighty dollars, you know, exaggerating eighty dollars for gas, uh, gasoline, and you know, and then through everything. What do you first of all before COVID? Were you working on any pro, uh, any anything you want to throw out? You want to talk about at all? And then what are you going to do after that? This thing kind of quells a little bit. Or goes down. Well, to digress, I want to, uh, to touch a point you brought up, brought on. You know, I, I did an album in front of an all-black audience called That White Boy is Crazy. I did that <laughs> yes. back in the day, back in the, in the, in the early 80s. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you know what I, whenever people would say, it, it used to be that if, oh, if a black comedian could only talk about black life, uh, 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 a Jewish comedian could only talk about Jewish life, uh, you know, an Italian kid could only talk about being raised Italian, you know, uh, you know, but if, if you crossed that line and talked about other ethnicities, that was a taboo. Well, I grew up in Harvey, Illinois, in, in a predominantly black neighborhood. So I went back to Harvey, Illinois, and recorded an album in front of an all-black audience in Harvey, Illinois, uh, in my hometown, which were the toughest critics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey is scary right now. <laughs> so, but, so but, I but, hear you. <laughs> you know, in, in those days, see, I was talking about white audiences and black audiences. If white audiences didn't like you, they'd just whisper, I don't think he's that funny. Black audience say, yo, man, Richard Pryor is funny, and you are. You know, yeah, I know. I you know, know. I deal with it all the time. If uh, I watch other people go through that. <laughs> yeah. my, my thing was, is whenever somebody would say to me, uh, you know, white folks used to say, do black people laugh at your material? Because I would go on the Tonight Show, yeah. on, on Merv Griffin Show, on Dinah Shore. I'd go on Soul Train. I was the only white comedian ever to do Soul Train. Wow. And, I'd go on Train, and they'd say, that's great. Yeah, do uh, black people laugh at your material? And I, so I cut an album and I just hand them the CD and say, give me eleven ninety nine and find out if they do. Yeah, what exactly. Color, what color is laughter? Yeah, that's what color great. is laughter? It, you know, it, yeah. it's such an asinine, stupid thing to think that a black comic couldn't go in, into an all white audience and make them laugh or vice versa. Yeah. Because comedy is, is universal. Anyhow, 
That being said, right now, I, I just wrote a book called Still Standing, My Journey from Streets and Saloons to the Stage and Sinatra. Mm. It comes out June 9th. And so that, that, that's, that's what I worked on. Well, being said, it's all completed now. The book cover, everything's done. And that'll be coming out June 9th. And I'll be coming to Chicago to promote that. But awesome. also uh, uh, what I've been doing, I'm doing what you're doing, a Zoom thing uh, coming up in the future. Wherever I've been ever since I toured, I toured 14 years as the opening act for Frank Sinatra. Yeah. People will constantly ask me when I, I toured with Sammy Davis for three years and I toured with Dean Martin and I toured with Frank for 14 years. People are constantly sending me, tell me a Sinatra story or tell me a, a Sammy Davis Jr. or something like that. So I'm going to go on Zoom in, in about four weeks and I'm mm. going to, you know, people are going to pay to hear those stories. I'm going to put it all out to them. If, if, you, if you want to, I will sit here in front of you and tell you what uh, that you can ask me questions and I'll answer those questions and I'll tell you funny stories about the years with Frank and Sammy and Dean. Right. So I'm working on that. And the last thing I want to say is we in this comedy business or in the entertainment business are going to have to face a serious problem. Mm -hmm. People are not going to want to get back in crowds again right away. We're all OCD. Aaron, you know, everybody, we don't want to shake hands anymore. We're going to wash our hands 20 times a day. The world made us this way. This virus now, who's going to want to go sit in clubs next to strangers? Uh, is that going to happen overnight? No. And so we've got, we've got to figure in our business how to reinvent ourselves. That's right. And what you're doing right now is an example of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I felt that also. I, I hope that I was I hope that I can uh, ring my bell and say I was a little bit above, uh, in front of the curve when it came to all of this one because I started to hate the politics of comedy. So I, uh, I would just go off and branch off and do, um, you know, shows that I've created and shows that I, I made which I, turned me into what I think is a businessman. And from there in order to create income as a comedian. I started to do things that were different than other guys. Like I would have a class online that people would buy. I, I would have a, um, I have a, a couple of magazines that me and my girlfriend create in the area. We sell advertising. I have a couple of um, affiliate sales relationships with products that are online uh, that people may buy. So one of them is graphics that go on, on top of your pictures like memes, they help make memes a little bit more creative. And every time someone purchases this, this certain uh, product from the thing, it's called uh, Photify. It's an app off of the, the store I've, I've signed up and I got my company C Stand Up is part of that. So those are some of the small things that I'm doing because I haven't, I've never really, I don't know if I've never really wanted to be famous like Hollywood famous, but Hollywood always seems to be such a, a, a cutthroat, place you know it was always you know every time i hear a story it's like a war story or some kind of weird thing you know uh so i you know i i have never wanted to come well i won't say i won't don't want to come there but i, I fear coming there i guess and i have yet to come uh officially i come in and out i'll do a show if i get a show but people that live there man i won the, the rent is eight hundred dollars for a shoebox uh, and fifteen hundred dollars if you want a window, you know what I mean. So, it's 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 tough. You know, you have to have you have to be really established. So, well, the the reason for me being here, <clears throat> I would I would have never left Chicago, but in those days, wherever you went in nineteen seventy five, when the comedy team stood up, we started in nineteen sixty nine and stayed together till seventy five. In nineteen seventy five, wherever you went in America, people say, "What do you do for a living?" They say, "I'm a stand up comedian." The next question out of their mouth was, "Oh yeah." Have you ever been on Johnny Carson? In, in the eyes of America, if you hadn't been on Johnny Carson in those days, you weren't a comedian. Johnny Carson moved his show in 1972 to the West Coast, up yeah. to the West Coast. So all of us migrated out here because one appearance on The Tonight Show, your career was made. Freddie Perrins did one appearance, he got a sitcom the next day. Yeah. I struggled for years. After the comedy team split up, I slept in a car on Sunset, off of Sunset Boulevard, hitchhiking yeah. up and down. It wasn't my car, it was an old abandoned Nash Rambler up on Blacks where the wow. front seat came down. I would wash up in a gas station in the morning, hitchhike to the comedy store every night, begging to work for free. Yeah. You know, I, my, my wife and kids were in Chicago. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was struggling there. My wife wanted me to get out of show business, you know. And anyhow- You had a wife that, during that time? Oh, I had a wife and three kids. I went in the show business with a wife and three kids. Tim Reed wow. had a wife and two kids. I had a wife and three kids. 
But I finally got on at the comedy store and I finally got on the Tonight Show. It took me a while, but I got on the Tonight Show. But that first appearance on the Tonight Show, I was in the unemployment line. I was on my rear end. And, and, and the first appearance on the Tonight Show, the next day CBS signed me to a development deal. A guy named Lee Curlin from New York, from CBS, was watching the show. My whole life changed, Aaron. I got yeah. a check for $10,000 and $1,850 a month for one year to be tied to CBS. Right. M my rent, my groceries, everything for one year was paid in those days. I could concentrate on comedy. But right. that's, that's why we came out here, because yeah. that was the one show. Today, you don't have to leave Chicago or Seattle or Mattress, Ohio. You, with this, these kids that, can, that learn today, learn all this social media, you can become a major star. Yeah, you know, I've seen it. Media. And the classic example is Dane Cook. Dane yeah. Cook, whether you like Dane Cook or not, as his comedy is irrelevant, he's a funny guy, but mm -hmm. he went on the social media when it first came out. And, and and got millions of fans. He was yeah. selling out 15,000 seat arenas and he didn't do the Tonight Show. Yeah. I mean, he, the, the, right here, the social media. That's what the new comics today, it's a whole new world for them. Yeah, I know. Uh, I've seen that and that's, uh, that's also something that keeps me home. Plus I have my own little investments and people that I've invested in uh, that I don't want to lose uh, because I've, I've learned that the relationships are way more valuable than the money. Like I've had times where I've made what I think is a lot of money, but it didn't mean as much as me being able to sit with my grandma. If you come to, you know, you come to somebody like, uh, you know, Steve Jobs or, you know, one of these super rich, big bank account having guys and you say, hey, would you trade all the money you have to spend another time, a day with your father? They would do it two times over, so that has to tell you something, you know. I'll, I'll tell you on your, on your train of thought. Frank Sinatra, arguably the greatest career show business has ever known. Forget about that he was the greatest pop singer of all time. Right. You know, forget about all that. Forget about all of his hit records. He won. The, he was an actor. He was a director. He won the Academy Award. Never took an acting lesson in the movie From Here to Eternity. Never took an acting lesson. Won the Academy Award. This is a man who amassed a fortune. Yeah. All of that. And, and, and was a major star in six decades. The only male artist to ever record in seven decades. Him and, and, and Ella Fitzgerald was the only female. M mind you, all of this, I'm sitting at his home on his 82nd birthday. He mm -hmm. died five months later. Sitting around that room where all of his friends, Sidney Portier and his wife, Gregory Peck and his wife, uh, 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 Jack Lemon and his wife, Felicia, um, there were you know, all these people sitting there, all these big stars sitting there, Kirk Douglas and his wife, Ann. And we're waiting for the cake to come out. Frank, we had dinner. Frank, in those days, wasn't well. He only had a few months to live. He was sitting off in the corner, and, and, and the woman that used to take care of him, she was helping him, and she was helping feed him. And he, we, we didn't know if he was with us sometimes, off and on. And so we stopped making small talk. And somebody said, gee, where's the best place to live? And Gregory Peck said, well, Veronique and I have a villa in France, and we like it there. And um, uh, Robert Wagner and Joe St. John said, oh, we have a home in Aspen, and we like it there. And Frank Sinatra, off in the corner with his head down, said, the best place to live is where your friends are. And everybody turned around and went, whoa, yeah. Now, my point of this story is, here's a man who, the greatest career, arguably, that show business has ever known. In the end, it wasn't about Oscars, Emmys, Grammys, money. It was about relationships. That's right. In the end, that was, it was about that. So that's the lesson that, that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, this quest for fame and fortune is is ego driven, you know, and, and you don't want to, you, you, you don't want to follow your ego. You want to follow your spirit. It's That's ego right. driven. You know, I, I, I just, I, I tell you, I want to digress. I went to Ascension church in Harvey when I, when I, Tim Reed and I went on stage for a very first time and a joke that I had written got a big laugh. While I was on that stage, it was like an epiphany. Like all of a sudden I knew what I wanted to do. Oh yes. Yes. yes I wanted to. <clears throat> stand-up comedian. I went to church the next morning. It was a Saturday morning. There was no service there at all. It was a Saturday morning. I got on my knees and I prayed. I said, God, I now know what I want to do. I want to make people laugh. If you could help me make my living as a comedian, I'll never ask for anything else. I'll, I promise you, Lord, I'll give it back. I'll, I'll do charities. And I made those promises. Now, all my prayers were answered. Did I become a major star? No, I'm not a major star. But I've made a living for 50 years as a stand-up comedian. I've done 500 appearances on national television, 61 tonight. I've, I've, I've hosted the Letterman Show. I've done, I've done a lot of things. I'm still not a star. I know that. I know what a star is. I toured with a star, Frank Sinatra. I toured with Sammy. I know what a star is. But I'm a working comedian, and that's all I ask for. 
I didn't ask to be famous or rich. I just said, if you could let me make my living making people laugh. And that's how I've made my living for 50 years. That's interesting. Uh, because, I mean, again, I, I saw you on television and you and Tim, and Tim went on the WKRP, Cincinnati, all that stuff. You guys were, I guess, stars of my eyes. But so you say that, and I understand the levels. I mean, I've, t I've been able to be in the room with guys like 50 Cent. And I can see how the people react to those dudes compared to how they would react to, say, you know, me, right? And there's a difference. But, and uh, I guess Frank Sinatra, of course, you, because you went with him, you saw that. But, um, so I, I get it, man. I, I totally understand. But again, none of that stuff matters if you, if you, if nobody loves you, you know, if, if you, nobody wants to be around you, it, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, let, me, let me say this, 85% of all stand-up comedians I met in my life, Aaron, and this is my uh, humble opinion, 85% of all stand-up comedians I met are insecure, neurotic, sometimes psychotic, loved, starved, wrecks, total wrecks. <laughs> the other 15% are gifted, confident people who say, I know how to write a joke and I know how to tell one. I like to think that I'm in the latter, but never trust somebody that tells you they're sane, but... <laughs> <laughs> Right. But, but, but so, you know, that, that, you know, that, that's what they're about. Actors, actresses, they're, they're, they're like little children sometimes wanting a whole lot of love, you yeah. know. And if you're an insecure, neurotic, love starved wreck when you're poor and unknown, when you're rich and famous, it doesn't get better. It gets worse because you thought rich and famous was going to take all this angst away. And when you find out it doesn't, then you have to go inside and say, right. uh, and, and the inner journey is far more exciting than the outer journey. <laughs> now, is some of that stuff in you, in the book that you uh, you wrote? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't want to steal all your content here. This is great, man. I appreciate you sharing this with us. You know, well, I can tell though it was thought out very very deep. Me, deep. Me, the the book is a lot about. I had eight brothers and sisters and grew up in a shack. You know, we were raggedy poor, holes in my shoes. <clears throat> I shined shoes in taverns, set pins in bowling alleys, caddied in the summertime, sold newspapers on the corner, all to feed my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm taking the audience from that journey, from that little boy who, who on his hands and knees in a bar and hearing Sinatra on the jukebox yeah. in Hartford, Illinois, to one day I take them on a journey from that little boy hearing Sinatra on the jukebox to one day carrying Frank Sinatra's coffin out of a church in Beverly Hills, California, because I was a pallbearer. Yeah. I take them on that journey. Mm. Who were the other pallbearers? Uh, w one was, uh, was Don Rickles and me and Steve Lawrence and, uh, Frank's business manager and Frank's, uh, lawyer and his, uh, uh, his valet. Wow. Wow, man. So, Ooh. so it, it was, it was an honor and it was an honor to speak. You know, you talk about pressure opening for Frank Sinatra was one for 20,000 people in the arena. Yeah. And she would go down low and the, the audience go, whoa. And the orchestra would strike a bump, 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 bump and they go, ah. And then they introduce me and people go, oh. They yeah. Thought, they yeah, thought Frank was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> that was pressure enough. But being, speaking at his funeral, I can't Ooh. tell you, you walked out in that church. In that church were 660 something people right. of the biggest names in the world. Yeah. In the world yeah. sitting in front of you. Right. And, just and to I, get in, just to be able to get in that room was a big feat of, of uh, uh, you know, so to be one of the six guys who carried him, man, that that definitely says a lot. Well, and, and, and to speak, and I knew he wanted me to make him laugh because every, every every night before I'd go on stage, Frank would see me going, going by his restroom. He'd say, Tom, are you going on? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, be brief and be funny. You know, he'd, he'd, <laughs> right. <laughs> one way, he'd say, be funny. And I'd say, okay, and be brief. You know, he was always like that. So yes, what I knew in my brain, he would want me to make them laugh if I could in the church. And it was a real solemn it, it moment. I, it's in my book of what happened. Okay. I told a funny story and I made the audience laugh. I made it, and, I, and I know that's what he would have wanted. He would have wanted me to make them laugh and I did. Yeah, did they, um, I know this, this, did they record that, uh, that funeral? No, I wish they would have. I, it, yeah. But you know, he didn't want that. We went to Sammy Davis's funeral. I went with Frank when yeah. Sammy died. And, yeah. and uh, it was huge, like 2,500 people, and, and it was very theatrical. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and uh, Frank said that in the limo on the way home, he said, that, I don't want that. I would want a quiet, a small little funeral. He, he said, I don't want that, that much theater. I said, and I jokingly said, you know what, Frank? Because, you know, he had that song, it's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. I yeah. said, Frank, when you die, I said, they should probably bury you at quarter to three in the morning. You know? Oh, wow. 
I said, have all your buddies around with a shot of Jack Daniels and toast you. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you. He said, yeah. He said, you make that happen, Tommy. I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell your family how you're supposed to be buried. And they'll have another plot right next to you where they'll bury me. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's, man, that's an, that's an incredible story, man. Um, just some of those moments. I know some of the richest moments that I've had as a performer have been the ones where we're all sitting around or we're going on our way going somewhere to do the show. The show is always what it is. We enjoy that, of course. But the moments that you're riding in the car with these guys or coming back from the show or you're sitting in the back of the club right after everybody's gone home are, you know, man, those are the richest parts, man. So I think what's happening here is we're, we're uh, running out of time. Okay. And, uh, and so, man, I want to uh, thank you so much for uh, helping me out with this. I'm launching this and I'll definitely send you a link to it. I appreciate that, Aaron, and I wish you the best. You're a good guy, and you're a typical Chicago guy. We're, we're you know, we're just friendly people. We, we, you know, we reach out to one another, and I always support Chicago comedians because I, I am one, and I remember what it was like starting out. I wish you the best. Thank you, man. Goodbye.